Hi, this is Mel Strong, and this is a quick overview of my weather balloon project. And the big idea is to have students construct a graph by hand looking at real data that was collected from a weather balloon. And upon finishing their graph, they'll learn something about the atmosphere. So the way I start this, and I've done this with sixth graders on up through college students, is I ask my students, what happens to the temperature in the atmosphere as you go up? And the answer you'll get depends on the age of your students. Some will think, well, you go up in the mountains, it gets colder, so it should get colder as you go up. Some will think you're getting closer to the sun, therefore it should get warmer as you go up. And then we talk about the fact that out the, the sun port at Albuquerque is one of the few airports in the country that launches weather balloons every day. In fact, we launch one at about 5 or 6 in the morning, and then they launch another one about 5 or 6 in the afternoon. And these weather balloons, as they go up, have this instrument package that are recording and transmitting back values uh, for different kinds of weather variables, such as uh, temperature and humidity, air pressure, wind, etc. Now, if you if you stumbled upon this lecture from somewhere else on the internet, uh, all the materials for this are on my website at millstrong.org. And so, one of the things you're going to need for this is the data to have the students plot. So what we're looking at here is I have organized the data from the weather balloon into different columns. Okay, so we've got columns of height, temperature, humidity, and then there's some wind stuff on there. Now all of the numbers on this, and there's three pages of them, have come from the weather balloon. And, and, the, and the idea here is we want the students to plot these uh, plot the data and look at the graph and try to figure something out. Now, I'm only going to have them think about two columns. I'm going to have them plot the temperature in Fahrenheit, so this column, and the height above the ground in feet, which is this column. Okay, so right away, you might be wondering why am I not doing anything in metric? And reason number one. People don't think well in metric, so a student can visualize something in feet and they can imagine what something feels like in Fahrenheit much easier than if, you, if we do uh, centigrade and in, in, in meters. Secondly, the Weather Service still publishes most documents in the United States in feet and Fahrenheit. Okay, so we're going to be consistent with that. But if you want to do it in metric, the numbers are all here for you if that's what you'd rather do. Now, it would be inhumane to have the students plot all of these numbers by hand. So what I've done is I've shaded every certain number of rows, and I have them only plot the shaded points. So on my website, I've got different versions of this, where every other row is shaded, or every fourth row is shaded, or every tenth row is shaded. So you can kind of look at them and, and figure out how many points you think your students will be able to do in the time frame that you have. So I think on the on the uh, the smallest data set I have is something like 12 or 13 points total that they that they plot. And on the other hand, to plot all of them, it's well over 100. So I have them plot these points just the shaded ones on graph paper. So the first problem is how are you going to make all of this data fit on graph paper? Now, it's going to depend on the graph paper that you have, but it's the first challenge that you have or that your students are going to have is to figure out a scale. Okay, so the graph paper that I use is this engineering filler paper. And it turns out that through trial and error, I have discovered that if I take three of these and I have the students tape them together into one long sheet, it looks kind of like this. Like this, so there's three of them taped together here. That the data from this weather balloon fit pretty well on that kind of graph. Now, whatever you've got, you've got to figure out a scale, or your students have to figure out a scale. So the way I have my students do that, in order to figure out the scale, we got to know what kind of graph paper we have, and then we have to figure out 
what are the extremes in the data? Okay, so overall, the graph that we're trying to make, we're going to put we're going to plot temperature on the x-axis and we're going to plot height on the y-axis. Okay. Now, this weather balloon went up to about, if you look at the last data point on here, on the last page, was about 100,000 feet. And 100,000 feet, it was about minus 40 degrees. And then the weather balloon pops. So what happens is as they go up, they get bigger, 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 and then they pop and they fall back to Earth. And that's the last data point. So what that means is, if we're going to plot all those points, the height is going to start at zero down here, and the last point that they're going to plot is going to be about 100,000 feet. Okay, so, so we know that we have, we've got to accommodate that kind of scale in the vertical. But what about the horizontal? Well, to figure that out, I have my students go through the temperature column, okay, and we need to figure out what was the hottest and what was the coldest. So the hottest is the very beginning. So here, the very first point is zero feet above the ground. It's 90 degrees. So the balloon's sitting on the ground. Then it launches, and as it starts to rise above the ground, you see the temperature start to drop. Okay, and they keep going down and keep going down. However, the coldest temperatures are not the last. So a lot of students figure, well, the coldest must be at the end minus 40, but it's not. If you go through that column of temperature, you'll find that the, the coldest temperatures are actually about halfway down the second page in the Fahrenheit column again, about minus, 100, minus 105 is about the coldest it gets. Okay. Now they may not hit 105 depending on which of the data sets you're using, but somewhere around minus 100 they're gonna they're gonna have to plot. Okay, so Positive 90 to minus 100 is our range, more or less, in Fahrenheit. So again, depending on, you know, the graph paper, you're going to have to come up with a scale that fits. Now it turns out with, again, taping the three sheets together like, like we've been doing here with my graph paper, what we came up with is that each horizontal gradient is about four degrees Fahrenheit per square. So each little square on the graph paper is four degrees Fahrenheit. And then vertically, 1,000 feet per square. Okay, so with my setup, with the three sheets taped together, using this, it, it fits. But again, you're probably a different paper than I do, and you'll have to figure out a, a slightly different scale maybe. Okay, the other thing to keep in mind is that these numbers, when you look at them, they start out as positive numbers, right? So we're positive 90, positive 46, positive 16, but then somewhere down around in here, we get into negative numbers. And then they continue negative for the rest of the, of the graph. So that means that on their x-axis, you're going to have positive numbers and you're going to have negative numbers. And the zero point be not quite exactly in the middle, but somewhere around in the middle. Okay, now, when your students are done, they're going to have a graph that looks something like this. Now, what I've done here is I've plotted all of the points on Excel. Now, the students are not plotting them all. They're plotting a subset of them. But if they were to plot all of them, this is what it looks like. The weather balloon starts out. It's about 90 degrees at the surface. And then you can see it gets cooler with height until it gets a little past 50,000 feet and then starts getting warmer with height, even though it's got some wiggles in there. Now, that's not usually what students guess was going to happen. Some thought it was cooler than, with height or some thought it maybe it was warmer with height, but usually nobody figured or nobody guessed it was going to do both. Now, this is all the points, all the data. If I compare that, say, to a subset, like let's say you decided to have the students just plot 12 points, okay? 
Well, that's what this looks like. So you can see the wiggle, it's not so many wiggles, but uh, the overall pattern is still the same. And so no matter what you have them plot, they should still see this general this general pattern. So I'm going to go back to all of the data here and let's talk about what this means. So if I were to show uh, weather balloon data from say the day after this or the, the day after that and we plotted, we made the same kind of graph, what we would notice is that this exact pattern changes day to day but the overall trend is the same. In other words, it gets cooler with height to a point and then it starts to get warmer with the height. That transition between those two is called the tropopause. So I'm going to have my students put that on their graph. That's the tropopause. Now all of the air above the tropopause is called the stratosphere. And all of the air below the tropopause is called the troposphere. So if we did this exercise on different days, what we would notice is that this exact height of the tropopause changes, especially with the seasons. So in the winter, it's a lot lower. Uh, in the summer, it's higher. But this general trend uh, we see every day. And that sets up these natural divisions in the atmosphere, the bottom two layers. Now, if you look in any science textbook at any grade level, they'll talk about the layers of the atmosphere. So here's an example of a, uh, of a, of a, out, of a out of a textbook. So what they're showing is basically what we've graphed. Um, their weather balloon gets cooler with height and then hits the tropopause, starts to get warmer with height. That's the stratosphere. Now our weather balloon stopped right there at about 30 kilometers. That's, where, that's when they pop. But if it kept going, it would have gotten... Uh, kept getting warmer and then hit another transition called the stratopause and then it gets cooler again, goes through a layer called the mesosphere, then goes through another transition and the last layer is the thermosphere. Now, there's a lot of, you know, every uh, textbook I've seen, they, they talk about these layers, but really the only, the only layers that are important, the only layer that's important really is the troposphere. That's where all the weather is, that's where all the clouds are, that's where all the moisture is. Uh, the stratosphere kind of serves as a lid. Okay, so these are the, really the two most important layers. The others really don't matter that much. Now, once we've labeled this, you have the option of adding more information to the graph and annotating it. So I'm going to go through kind of what I do, and it's up to you how much of this you want to add uh, to your student's graph. But on my website, I have a annotated version, and it's in color, even though my printout is not. Um, this is an example of the kind of thing that we add to our graphs. Uh, we do this as a class, as a group. So I'm going to talk about the stratosphere. So one of the mysteries is, why does it get warmer in the stratosphere? And it's not because you're getting closer to the sun. Up here, you've got these molecules of O3, three oxygens bonded together in a molecule called ozone. And it turns out that ozone absorbs ultraviolet radiation. So UV comes in, whacks one of these ozones, it splits apart into two uh, molecules, an O2 and an O. Now these two parts will recombine and reform ozone, but that uh, the splitting of this molecule produces heat, and that heat is what is warming up the stratosphere up here. Collectively, we call this the ozone layer. So the ozone layer, absorbing UV, is warming things up up here. You get above that, and you run out of ozone, it gets cooler again. Now, I should point out that um, everybody knows you go outside, you get a sunburn because of UV. That's a very, very small amount of UV compared to what's coming in from above the, uh, on the top of the atmosphere. Okay, so the, the ozone layer basically makes it possible to live on land. Uh, that's how much UV it actually blocks. Um, I like to show my students a couple pictures of the stratosphere because there's, there's a misconception as to what it might look like. Um, so here's an image. Some people with some 
more expendable income than I have, get a weather balloon and a smartphone, and they launch it. And then they use a tracking service to find it and recover the pictures. So this picture was taken at 100,000 feet. And you can see that in 100,000 feet, uh, the sky is black, right? And you can see the curvature of the Earth. So if I didn't tell you where this was from, you'd probably think we were in space. There's so little air by the time you get to the stratosphere that the sky is black. Uh, a couple more pictures. If you remember this guy, Felix, he set a world record at the time jumping out of a balloon. And he jumped out at 128,000 feet. And so that's, that's 28,000 feet higher than where our weather balloon popped. He's still in the stratosphere. He jumped out over New Mexico. Um, and again, if you just kind of look at, if I didn't tell you where this was from, you think he's in space, right? He's got a space suit. You see the black sky, curvature of the Earth, etc. So that's the stratosphere. So by the time you're in the stratosphere, there's almost no air left. I mean, three quarters of it is, in the, is all in the troposphere. And the, all those layers that I showed you previously, there's very, very little air in those layers. So, um, back to our annotated graph. So that's the stratosphere. Now we can, um, in my class, we have, when we do this exercise, uh, we have um, gone through, the, the students have learned about clouds. So I have placed in here uh, the appropriate locations of where different clouds form. So the high, what we call the high clouds, that means high in the, in the troposphere. So your cirrus clouds, cirrocumulus, cirrostratus clouds. The mid-level clouds are the altocumulus or the autostratus. The low-level clouds, the cumulus or the stratus clouds. And then the cumulonimbus are, are the weird ones that start low and they grow all the way up uh, to the tropopause and sometimes have this uh, what we call an anvil head on them. Um, commercial airlines fly about 30 to 35,000 feet, so you can draw that in there. On this day, that's about the middle of the troposphere. And also, remember that the zero point on this, that is zero at the airport zero, not sea level zero. So how high is the Sandias? Um, I have them plot that in. That comes out to be about, on, on this graph, if the airport is at zero, the top of the Sandia peak is about 5,600 feet above above the airport. So I have them draw that in just to kind of give a scale to everything in the in the in the uh, on, on this on this graph.